We want our children to know how to bounce back, know how to fall and get up. It's part of learning to walk, right? They learn to walk because they understand what balance is when they fall. The falling is part of the process. Hi, this is Danae. I'm the founder of Simple Families. Simple Families is an online community for parents who are seeking a simpler, more intentional life. In this show, we focus on minimalism with kids, positive parenting, family wellness, and decreasing the mental load. My perspectives are based in my firsthand experience raising kids, but also rooted in my PhD in child development. So you're going to hear conversations that are based in research, but more importantly, real life. Thanks for joining us. Hi there, that voice you heard in the intro is Leslie Cohen Rubery. Leslie is a licensed clinical social worker, psychotherapist, and she's the founder of Is My Child a Monster, a parenting therapy podcast. Today, Leslie and I are talking all about exposure, exposing our kids to things that they're afraid of, exposing our kids to things that we're afraid of, exposing our kids to other lifestyles, other cultures, historical events, current events. With the availability of the news and the media, Kids have the potential to be exposed to a lot more now than they did in the past, for better or worse. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoy my chat with Leslie. Hi, Leslie. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks, Danae. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thanks for joining me in this conversation today. Great. Thank you for having me. Start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Okay. Well, I'm sort of in the second rendition of my career. As I just started, I released a podcast, a brand new parenting therapy podcast, which I'm really excited about. But before that, I was a therapist. I am a therapist in private practice in a small town where I get to um, go into the schools. I do a lot of parenting groups. I did a lot of school lectures, teacher trainings. It was really quite lovely. And I was in a lovely little bubble. Like I really got myself established. And, um, and since this mental health crisis, and I have these people who are struggling, and families, and I can't meet, you know, I can't meet the need, we're all having trouble meeting the need. I just got this idea of saying, okay, I got to get my information out further. So I'm doing something I've never done before, which is this podcasting world. But um, my journey to get to this place is interesting, because I felt a lot of similarity and resonated with your journey, that there were transitions. I started out with um, a master's in special ed, working with kids with special needs. And then I realized these kids go home to their families every night. And I said, I got to work with these families. I was very excited about that. So then I got my master's in social work and um, started working with families. And then I had my own kids. (laughs) <laughs> and when I had my own kids, it was that there was all this professional um, experience that I had. There's all this knowledge, rich knowledge from both my special ed and my um, master's in social work that, you know, just I tried to lean on it. And I was like, oh, some of this stuff is working and some of it's not. And it was quite perplexing because I have three children, one daughter who was quite challenging. And um, it really woke me up to saying, okay, what works here? And so like you, when you speak of bringing together these two worlds, it was really quite rich for me as well to bring together my professional life and my personal life and and have all this experience together that really, as my daughter said, made me who I am. So that's really important. So today I want to talk a little bit about exposure. Well, actually a lot about exposure. Um, (laughs) This is a topic that interests me so much. Um, You know, so I have a seven and a nine-year-old and Mm -hmm. I think that I have always, I mean, from the very beginning, I think I always wanted to expose them to a lot of things, but exposure can be uncomfortable. And exposure is really kind of the root of treating many types of anxiety. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about what that word exposure means to you? Yes. Well, you just used it in a way that sort of describes the the extent. There's a lot that can go into the word exposure. Um, as a matter of fact, my parenting style was go, go, go. And so with my three children, I wanted to do a lot of things with them. So I was exposing them to this, to that, to all these things. And that's one way of exposing our children. But when I say exposure, there is this idea of 
actually exposing yourself to the uncomfortable. So you mentioned being uncomfortable. That's in essence the definition that I sort of use, which is when we are doing exposure work informally or formally, we're really exposing ourselves to what is uncomfortable, the things that we want to avoid. So whenever you talk about exposure, you're also talking about probably avoidance. Mm -hmm. And um, anxiety, which we all know is an you know, epidemic right now. Um, many, many people are feeling it for very good reasons. Uh, the reason that exposure is becoming more and more important right now is an antidote to helping us helping us deal with the instinct of, I want to avoid that because it's uncomfortable. You know, I think we really need to take our time and look at, okay, exposure may be a path to helping us all, you know, face the life and get the life we want to live. Yeah. I think about from the beginning when we have kids, right? We want them, their babies, their infants, and it's our job to keep them comfortable and to yes. feed them when they're hungry and change them when they're wet and help them to stop crying, but essentially to keep them comfortable. Right. So I think as a parent, it goes against our intuition that our kids need to be uncomfortable. And when do we make that switch? It's just, what do you think? Oh, we, we don't cut that umbilical cord too easily. So yes, I think, um, Helping parents understand that witnessing their children in pain is part of the parenting experience is really, really, really hard for parents. So as you said, it starts in infancy and we are wired to react, right? We hear babies cry, we are wired to react. So it is going against our instinct because as they grow, we need to grow. So it is, when does it happen? It happens slowly. I say it happens, you know, as soon as that child is in your arms, whenever that is, um, it's about greeting that child with both and both. Yes, I'm here to support and connect to you. And I'm here to witness you on your journey, but it's not one or the other. Yeah. It, it, I think finding a balance as a parent is hard. I think, you know, when it comes to facing unhappiness in our kids, any sort of unhappiness, it makes me really uncomfortable, right? I think yes. something I've been talking about a lot on the podcast recently is screen time, right? And when mm -hmm. we deny screen time, if our kids really mm -hmm. love screen time, it's facing that discomfort in, wow, saying no and hearing their reaction is going to be uncomfortable. How do we work through that discomfort? And I think one thing that we underestimate is how often challenging behavior is rooted in anxiety and avoidance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that that discomfort and that pushback we get from our kids may be rooted in them being afraid of something. Exactly. So there's two parts. One is our own reaction to their discomfort, seeing them struggle. Um, and I think just like you're saying, go below the surface to understanding a lot of their pain and discomfort and difficult, you know, challenging behaviors is the underlying cause of anxiety. They are afraid of what they're dealing with showing up in life. And it's ours as well. There's going below the surface for us as well when we are dealing with what's uncomfortable about it. Um, we might feel like we are a failure. Um, we might have a myth that it is our job, it is our responsibility to make sure our children are happy. So um, I did parenting classes uh, at our local elementary school for like 25 years. And one of the questions I'd ask every year is, what do you expect from your children? Mm -hmm. And they would, you know, in terms of raising them, uh, what do you hope for your children? And they say, I want them to be decent human beings. I want them to be civil, kind, all these lovely values and, uh, and attributes. But no one ever said, I expect my children to misbehave. No one ever said, I expect my children to struggle, right? And parents also in that parenting group would say to me, because I sound good, right? I can talk a good talk. They don't know me as a parent. They did it because I, I shared a lot of what I was like as a parent. But they would say, oh, your kids are so lucky they'll never need therapy. And I would say, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'd say, no, no, no. You guys have college funds for your kids. I have therapy funds for my kids. <laughs> right. Because, right? I mean, our children are going to struggle. No matter, and I was far from a perfect parent. I wouldn't want to be a perfect parent because, again, we don't want to smooth the road out that much. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, we want our children to know how to bounce back, know how to fall and get up. It's part of learning to walk, right? They learn to walk because they understand what balance is when they fall. The falling is part of the process. The labor is part of our the process of becoming a human being. So we don't want to forget how integral part of living the struggle actually is. We don't want it, but it doesn't mean it's not important. I love that expression. I don't want to smooth the road out too much. I never thought mm-hmm. about it like that. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, in my in my journey to not be a perfect parent, I don't think that's really something I have to work at that comes very naturally <laughs> to me to be yes. perfect. Um, but for me, a lot of it is, you know, if I even try to set this example that I get it all right and I do it all right, that that's what I'm setting for my kids. And that is the expectation that they're going to have for themselves. So exactly. me embracing my imperfections is not only so they have a bit of a bumpier road, but also because they will someday probably be parents themselves. They'll be humans themselves and have those imperfections. And I think the more they see me closer to that image, I think that sets up an unhealthy expectation for them. It's so true. It's so true. I can go into a whole thing about modeling, but um, our children do need to see us with our imperfections. So, you know, the the word perfect has been coming up a lot in my house. My seven-year-old, um, every time she makes a mistake, she'll say, oh, I'm not perfect. I wish I was perfect. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. I sort of on the fly one day came up with this expression, you're not perfect, but you're wonderful. And I made a little mm-hmm. bracelet with letter beads and for her. And so she wears that now. It says not perfect, but wonderful. And oh. it's interesting how it has literally this one little thing, and it's funny where you, when you find something that works, this one little expression has changed yes. her narrative. Every time she makes a mistake now, instead of saying, oh, I wish I was perfect, she says, I'm not perfect, but I'm wonderful. And it's so funny how little things stick. Oh, I love it. That's beautiful. I, I have clients who actually ask me, can I have a mantra? What's my mantra yes, for the week? That's they her just, mantra. <laughs> right. I think that's fabulous. That's really fabulous. It's. I also love the expression I've given this mantra to some people, which is uh, perfectly imperfect. Mm, I am I perfectly that. imperfect. And yes. yes, it's it is about embracing being imperfect. But I want to get back to when you said mm-hmm. it's so hard for parents to deal with that feeling when your child is struggling. So as I said, you know, we want to remember to go below the surface to understand that that struggle for us as a parent is okay. And when we say to our children, oh, see, I make mistakes, they do not believe you. Mm -hmm. No matter what, especially the one young ones think that you are perfect. They do not see your imperfections the way you see them. That's really important because then you try to say, well, see, I made a mistake. I didn't, I didn't, I overcooked the rice or I, whatever it is, they don't see it. And so children are trying to live up to, to an expectation that you guys are perfect. And that's really challenging. So I would just share with them instead of, trying to convince them, I would just say, so what's the problem with feeling imperfect? So go back to them and actually expose them. Here's the exposure work, expose them to, so you're uncomfortable because you're not perfect. So it makes you, how uncomfortable does that make you on a scale of one to 10? Like, is it, it's an awful feeling? Well, how can you live with that feeling and know you're, you're, you know, you're okay. So I like to turn it back on the child instead of trying to convince them I mean, I love your mantra of, you know, perfect. I'm not perfect, but I'm wonderful. But the idea is, is to actually acknowledge the struggle. So instead, when they come home and say, oh, no, I forgot my violin at school and I got in trouble, instead of saying, okay, well, tomorrow I'll help you. We'll put your violin by the door. We'll make sure that doesn't happen or whatever. You just say, wow, what was that like? And look at you, you're here today to tell me about it. Tell me what happened so that you actually embrace and appreciate the struggles. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I was just talking with a client about this the other day. What does it mean to get in trouble? And it's so funny because it's different to every kid. Like one kid would be like, I got detention today. I got suspended. And then another kid is like, my teacher told me to, to stay quiet or like something very simple, like a simple correction versus a significant correction. And that means something very different for every kid. This quote, getting in trouble is not, it's pretty subjective. 
it's pretty subjective. And uh, you said you have two children, so you probably see that they are unique individuals. Mm -hmm. And so as we define what exposure is for one child versus another, it's very, very, very different. So how they define getting in trouble. So for one child, like the reason why my daughter, uh, one of my, I have three girls, three children, uh, one was more challenging is because I would ask the other two to do something. Can you go call Poppy, tell him we're running late. And if I asked my daughter Dale to do that, she would have a tantrum. She would yell at me. She would, you know, and I did eventually understand that that was her anxiety, but the exposure to different things is tremendous. You know, I could ask one of my three children to go to the garage and get something in the dark. I couldn't ask the other two to do that. So we really want to, and it's a beautiful thing for us to see our children as individuals and realize that um, exposure is very unique for each child. Mm -hmm. Going into the unknown is very unique for each person and defining life is very different for each person. Yeah. Something I talked about recently on the podcast was introducing or exposing kids to the grind, right? The idea that you wash laundry and then you fold it and you put it away and then you do it again. And that is something that is so valuable, but so hard for kids to grasp. Yes. You mean that we're going to do it again and again and again? Again, every day we're going to do right. the same thing again. And yeah. And I think as parents, because it's, we see the discomfort in our kids. Like we do, I do laundry every day and then I fold the laundry and the kids have just a handful of things to put away, right? The day's laundry mm -hmm. before, but you know, that the reason that I do that is so that they have that exposure every day of doing the same thing. The laundry just reappears every day. And mm -hmm. that is the lesson, not even putting it away. It's just that this is part of the grind of life is that so many of these things continue to repopulate themselves. And <laughs> that's something I think was a hard lesson for me as a mom. Yes, a mom. is to, to help them understand how you get that across, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to pause for a few words from today's sponsors. The first sponsor is Fast Growing Trees. From shade to fresh fruit to privacy and natural beauty, let fastgrowingtrees.com help you plant your dream garden with their expert advice and fast, reliable shipping. Their plant experts curate thousands of easy to grow plant, shrub, and tree varieties for your unique climate. No more waiting in lines, hauling heavy plants around. With fast growing trees, you can order online and the plants arrive at your door in just a few days. In our house, we've loved not only their outdoor plants, but also their indoor plants which I found to be a great value and super convenient. Now, if only I can keep them alive. Fortunately, they do come with a 30-day Alive and Thrive guarantee. So you know that everything is going to look great right out of the box. Join over 1.5 million happy Fast Growing Trees customers. Go to fastgrowingtrees.com simple to get 15% off your entire order. Get 15% off your entire order at fastgrowingtrees.com simple. Our second sponsor is Just Thrive Probiotics. I know that for many of us, stress seems to run our life, keeps us on edge, refuses to let us to relax or unwind. Just Thrive Probiotic and Just Calm can help you reclaim your health, your happiness, and your peace of mind. Just Thrive's breakthrough probiotic formula is clinically proven to balance your gut, which is huge because 90% of Americans have an overgrowth in bad bacteria in their gut. And studies show that an unhealthy gut can lead to an increase in stress hormones. I have found it to be incredibly simple for both the adults and the kids. It comes in a capsule form for adults and for kids, I just open the capsule and put it onto applesauce. Right now, when you go to justthrivehealth.com and use the promo code SIMPLE, you can get 20% off a 90-day bottle of Just Thrive Probiotic and Just Calm. That's like getting a month for free. Go to justthrivehealth.com and use the promo code SIMPLE to get 20% off a 90-day bottle of Just Thrive Probiotic and Just Calm. Our third and final sponsor for today is StoryWorth. StoryWorth has been a Simple Family sponsor over the years, and I'm so glad that they are because it's a gift that keeps on giving. This year is going by so fast and Father's Day is coming up. If you want to give your dad a truly unique and meaningful gift that will make them feel special and loved, try StoryWorth. StoryWorth is an online service that helps you and your loved ones preserve precious memories and stories for years to come. What I've loved is that it has helped connect multiple generations of our family and the stories that sometimes get lost. This is a way of putting them down on paper to keep forever. So this year for Father's Day, give all the dads in your life a unique, meaningful gift that you'll cherish for years, StoryWorth. 
Right now for a limited time, you're going to save $10 on your first purchase when you go to storyworth.com slash simple. That's S-T-O-R-Y-W-O-R-T-H dot com slash simple to save $10 on your first purchase. Storyworth.com slash simple. Thanks for supporting our sponsors. Back to today's episode. I believe sometimes when we're parenting, um, if for me it was trying to teach my children the, the message of fairness and unfairness. Um, I was like, I am not going to get that message across. I'm going to do what I need to do, which is what you're doing. You're doing the laundry. And sometimes we try to overteach our children. Just do it in the met in, you know, in the long term, they're going to get that. You know what? We did laundry every single day and I ended up doing it. So instead of trying to teach our children the value of it, just live it. Mm -hmm. That's exposure too. just live that exposure. I did not treat my children where they each got one third of the donut or whatever the case may be. They would wish I brought home a donut. <laughs> um, <laughs> but whatever it was, it was I did treat them differently. If they complained, again, what we tend to go into defensiveness. We tend to go into explaining why am I doing this? Why am I treating you differently? And so instead of going into explaining it, I'm happy to explain it, but I'm also first and foremost, I'm going to turn it back to them and say, what's the problem? So if it's not fair, what's the problem? I don't think that's fair. I can't, yeah, it is uncomfortable. So I just want to validate that it is uncomfortable. As a therapist, do you know what I work on 90% of the time is helping people just experience emotion because we do such a good job of tucking away those uncomfortable feelings. Yeah. And it comes biologically. My newly five-year-old granddaughter said, we were reading a sweet little book and the narwhal had some uncomfortable feelings. And I said, and I know she doesn't like uncomfortable feelings. So I said, oh, look, he has uncomfortable feelings. And she really said, it's fine for the narwhal to have uncomfortable feelings. It's not okay for me to have uncomfortable feelings. And oh, I almost want to crack up beyond belief. <laughs> she is so clear in her mind, she's not going to have mm -hmm. uncomfortable feelings. So sometimes it comes from the child who is, you know, not letting you see those feelings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And her dad was the child who was biting his shirt mm -hmm. and, and, you know, keeping it in. And it's their children who get the somatic complaints, headaches, stomach aches, things like that. And then they're the children who let it out. So we see them experiencing those emotions. We have to deal with all the right. different children we have. Yeah. I have a kid like that who now writes it all down and ah, hands, hands me messages, which I it. think is so great. Cause I always can, I'm always feeling concerned about those kids that internalize and hold it all in yes. and seeing that maybe it doesn't all come out in a written explanation, or I mean, in a verbal explanation, maybe it comes out in a written explanation, but we can look yes. for those windows where we can get information if they do hold it in. Right. And the idea of exposure is uh, for the child that may not be able to verbalize it, writing it is a beautiful step in the direction. Do I think when they're adult, they will always be writing their partner? Maybe that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. And I also think it's on the way to learning how to use the, to expose themselves to, you know, verbal communication. So I think that's fantastic. And finding those small steps is key to exposing our children is do it mm -hmm. slowly. Yeah. Take your time. And the idea of reading the book, that's so important, right? Because if you're not ready to talk about your own uncomfortable feelings, you can hear all about other people's and other characters in books. Exactly. I read more adult, I read more children's book to adults <laughs> right, <laughs> right now in my life. I love children's books. I've love learned so them. much from children's books. I, I swear. Totally. I feel like that's where the lessons really are. Yeah. There's an author who I would love to get in touch with, Peter Reynolds. He wrote the book Ish. Oh, and... yeah. I have that in my backpack right now. I'm reading. Right. It yeah, I love it's that book. Ju it's just those are books that I think are written for both children and adults. And mm -hmm. it's all about exposing us to those. So, yes, I agree with you on reading books as a way yeah. to, again, another step to getting to feelings. Yeah. Now that my kids are getting a little older, I've been thinking about exposure um, to other lifestyles. So um, they've recently started watching The Masked Singer. Are you familiar with The Masked Singer? No, I'm not. Okay. It's kind <laughs> of like a, I don't know, it was somewhere, what, it's sort of like American Idol type reality show where there's like all of these celebrities who are hidden in masked costumes. Oh. And um, they, there are celebrity judges like Jenny McCarthy and I don't know, one of the pussycat dolls, I forget what her name is, um, Robin Thicke. Um, 
Nick Cannon, they're all judging or they're judging the singing, but they're also trying to guess who's behind the mask. So I don't know if that was a good description of the show. Anyway, this is the first show that my kids have really been exposed to pop culture. So we don't use profanity at home. I have nothing against profanity. I have lots of friends that use it. Doesn't bother me at all. I use it in my private life away from my kids, but we just don't use it at home. But there is some profanity in this show. And it's funny because they've never been exposed to it. Well, actually, to rewind, like a month ago, my daughter came to me and said, she has this friend at school, and she said, it's not fair that my friend's parents taught her all the cuss words, but you didn't teach me any. Yes. <laughs> and I thought that, I was like, oh, well, maybe I should not <laughs> like, because you need to know what's what, right? You need to know what's appropriate. And then they started watching the show. And for anyone with a kid listening, I'm going to cuss right now if you want to pause this. Um, So my, I heard my son say to my daughter the other day, sit your ass down. And I was like, oh, where'd you hear that? He's like, oh, Nick Cannon said it. <laughs> On the map, right. <laughs> so it's funny because I've never I've never exposed them to this sort of show before. I've never exposed them to this sort of language before. But it has brought up these teachable moments where I explain like, oh, actually, ass is a cuss word and you can't use that around other adults. You might find that other kids use that with other kids sometimes, but you have to be careful with those words. And that's why we don't use them around you. Um, So just explaining like what profanity is, because they're going to learn it somewhere, right? Whether it's from me or from somebody else. Um, But it's, that's been interesting getting, getting comfortable with that uh, exposure to things that they don't get in our house. Yes. And I do, I really do like to um, help families and people work towards looking for ways of exposing their themselves and their children to a wider lifestyle than what they're used to. I mean, it's wonderful. And I do think that sometimes going to, you know, a different ethnic restaurant, a different community, trying to, like you said, doing different things, uh, is really important. I ended up uh, taking my children. I live in a town where the schools are excellent, uh, but I actually chose to send them to a charter school. And the charter school was there was just there was there was something I was exposing them to because it was a different way of living, a different um, community. I just felt exposure was really important for them to understand that there are many many ways of doing things. So. Actually, in terms of education, they were homeschooled, they were it went to a charter school, and they also went to public school. And pe- people always say is, which is the best? And I'm like, no, there's something, there's something to learn in every setting. There's pros mm-hmm. and cons in every setting you're in. So really exposing them to different things is very important. Uh, we moved around, and that's why there were a number of changes. But I do think that um, your idea of exposing them to different things and not avoiding the difficult part of it. So like you said, the cuss words, you didn't say, okay, no, 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 you guys can't see that because there's cuss words. We narrow in our world. And that's what avoidance does. Avoidance keeps closing the doors to more and more experiences. I can't do this. I can't do that. And exposure is about being able to say, I can do this. I can do that. I can go into an environment which feels different. I can take a train to New York City and figure things out. I mean, it's scary. It's hard. Let's figure out the ways that you can do that. So um, I do think it's important to keep exposing them to different things. Yeah. I feel like our kids are much more exposed or, you know, I mean, with the internet and YouTube, there's so many more opportunities for them to be exposed to things that are beyond our control in a lot of ways that we can't control the narrative on. I think about, um, I have a a handful of middle school age kids that I work with. And the name that has come up a lot in my practice with parents and with middle schoolers is Andrew Tate. Um, so he, do you know who he is? No, I'm (laughs) okay. Essentially. I think he's an MMA guy who um, puts women down and talks about how men own women. And there's this really unhealthy narrative that he has created. And it's really kind of taken over middle schools. Like middle schools are having to do full interventions on behalf of the counseling staff, because so many middle school boys are being exposed to his content on YouTube. I think he might be in jail right now. I'm not exactly sure. Um, But 
it's it's been incredible to kind of watch and follow the news around this story because yes these a lot of these especially middle school boys are being exposed to his content on YouTube and they're picking up his narrative and it's cool and they're replicating it and the schools can't really keep it under wraps because it's just proliferating on YouTube. And that's the kind mm. of thing I'm like, you know, if you haven't already introduced your child to a conversation about this, they're going to be exposed to it somewhere um, along the line. And how do you how do you start those conversations um, rather than waiting for them to kind of erupt and come back on you? Yes, I totally agree with that. So I do think that there's this pendulum swing of overprotecting. I don't think that's a new idea, overprotecting our children. We also have, um, I'd say in the last 15, 20 years, very much child-centered worlds. Mm -hmm. So they go to children's museums. They go, you know, they don't go to an adult museum. They go to a children's museum, which is beautiful and fantastic. But what happened to the adult museum? So we want to expose them to both of these things. And that means this stuff in, in our culture that is not pretty that is not that goes against our values so I really do believe that instead of being polarized into I'm not going to expose my child to someone who thinks differently from me I actually want to expose them to someone who does think differently so we can start those conversations I do think like you said it's really important because once they get overwhelmed by that information then we they don't have the ability to think for themselves so we want to get them practicing you know doing things think for themselves challenge their thinking early with challenging conversations you can do that with the news and you, again i do want to say you want to be sensitive to different children you know every child is different but go ahead and have those difficult conversations about things. And remember, it's probably going to make you uncomfortable. There is nothing wrong with a parent saying, hey, you know what, I'm going to have this conversation, but I may be more uncomfortable than you having this conversation. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with saying that because now you're actually now you're modeling that you can handle discomfort. Right. That's what's important is that we want to model discomfort by actually saying, you know, let's say you're going to talk about you know, some kind of sexual orientation or some conversation about that. And you might say, I'm new at this. I'm having, I might have difficulty. I may be uncomfortable. I'm going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I was at a book fair recently and I saw this beautiful picture book for, okay, it was a, a children oriented picture book um, about Anne Frank's life. And yes. I bought it for my daughter and we read it and um, really for both of my kids, but she happened to be with me. So I read it to her first and she's seven and I was reading it and I was thinking, this is really heavy and this is yes. a big topic. Yes. Is she ready to really, does she have the moral reasoning to really understand this topic? So I'm thinking to myself, like were seven-year-olds, when you were raising a seven-year-old, were they exposed to topics like this? And how do you feel like when we're talking about exposure, how do we introduce heavy topics that are important, but might be beyond what our kids are capable of really understanding? Yeah, well, it's funny you bring up Anne Frank because one of my daughters now believes that her exposure to it at a young age, she was a, she was a, you know, active reader and she read a lot. So she did get exposed to it and it affected her at an early age, which is like, that was not okay for me. And I'm like, okay, good to know. Um, she thought it was too much. She, you know, it really was. So it, we, there's no manual here that says what's mm -hmm. right, what's wrong. There's no manual. And like I said, we are going to make some mistakes. So you, even if you just discuss it, and, you know, yes, you're going to ask yourself that question. Do I think she's ready for it? I think in our culture, we overprotect. So our tendency is to, you know, not do it. That's not true for all parents. Some parents are throwing everything at their child. Um, and yeah, my husband had a lot of fun, you know, doing movies with the kids, reading books, to the kids, and they were way over their head. And, you know, part of it is, you know, that exposure to it was somewhat fun and somewhat bonding for them. And at the same time, you know, you do want to ask the question, is this too much? Listen to your gut, but also 
ask yourself the question, am I, where's that gut reaction coming from? Is it coming from overprotection or is there something about my daughter that actually tells me she has a hard time letting go of things? She holds on. She is very empathic. She's going to, this could be too much right now. And you can introduce the book like that, which also helps, which is, Mm -hmm. Hey, I see you reading this book. There's a lot of, you know, intense material here that might, you will figure out as you grow up and you will get older and right now may be confusing. Do you Mm -hmm. want to wait on this or do you want to go ahead and try reading it? And if there's something that's confusing or upsetting that you will, you will say, Hey mom, I think this part, I need a little help on. So they learn to ask for help, which is a great thing to teach um, that you have given them more information about you might get uncomfortable. You might get confused. You might have some strong feelings. That's normal. And so we actually prepare them for what's coming, not just avoid it. Sometimes we're going to make that decision to not do it, but other times we're going to do it, but we're going to give them a little bit of that heads up, what we call in DBT, dialectic behavior therapy, a cope ahead. So Mm -hmm. here's what's coming. You You will read this and you might get uncomfortable. You have a lot of strong empathic feelings. So let's talk about what happens if those feelings show up. Mm, I just had that conversation with one of my kids yesterday. They were outside and I made something I knew they were going to totally balk at for dinner. So I stopped him at the door and I said, when you come into the house, you're probably going to see what I cooked for dinner. And I think you might have a bad reaction. Can you please hold that reaction and just sit quietly at the table? And it worked, right? That kind like yes. getting a step ahead of it. It did work in that situation. Oh, I love it. I did it with my husband too, when he would come <laughs> home from work and I knew I had papers all over the place or I had no time to do anything. Yeah. I said, Hey, just so you know, you're going to be walking into a disaster, right? Whether it was the kids, whether it was me, whether it was my paperwork, whatever it was, <laughs> all the above, I said, all the above. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> I said, just know you're walking into a disaster. Expectations is really, it helps to manage their expectations, yours. That was brilliant yesterday. (laughs) And you could do it for yourself. Right. You could say, they're going to walk in, they're going to complain and I'm okay. Yeah. You know what? How long? I often like to say, okay, how long do you need to complain? Do you need one minute? Do you need three minutes? I have my limit is five minutes. So I can handle three minutes of your complaining or something like that. Right. And it, it teaches them not everything's going to be pretty and perfect. Yeah. The hardest part about dealing with complaining is dealing with complaining is sitting with that discomfort yes. as a parent is the, right. the hardest And that's part. what we're trying to teach our children. Mm-hmm. So I like to verbalize that. That's better than the lecture of we all need to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. We want to actually live that. I, as we've been talking, it's really occurred to me what a privileged conversation this is that we get to pick and choose what our kids are exposed to and at what yes. rate they can handle it. Because I think that's a, the, a reality that is, is not true for much of the world. No. And that is so true. And the idea that children are not resilient is, is held up by that fact. You know, children can be exposed to the hard things in life and research shows that resiliency is about having one person in your life that's there for you. Can Mm -hmm. be a parent, can be a teacher, can be an aunt, can be a relative. And so what we see is not not the avoidance of those difficult things in life because they're out there, but rather making sure we have your child has that connection, that they have that ability. So um, we are, we are in a privileged, in a privileged conversation here. And the children that get exposed to things prove to us show that uh, resiliency is a human quality. And we want to embrace that and help our children see that. So I really agree with you that um, helping your child get exposed to things that are out there, allow them to see for themselves that they're capable Mm, yes, and that they can bounce back and that they have the skills to deal with the difficult things. I really appreciate right now that my son with their two children who are highly sensitive, uh, two highly sensitive grandchildren that, you know, even, even I'm a little hesitant to bring some up and he's talking about, you know, so-and-so's dog passed away, whatever. It's like, we need to talk about the, you know, the hard things that are out there. Parents, you know, through COVID, so many families had parents that were dying. Um, Parents in uh, some communities feel that we shouldn't talk about death 
And, you know, one of my favorite parenting topics was how do we talk about the difficult things with our children? So Mm -hmm. I say, do it. Right. Well, thank you so much for this conversation, Leslie. Tell tell us where we can find you online. I am, uh, you can find me either through my website now, which is wherever you find your podcast, Is My Child a Monster? A Parenting Therapy Podcast, you can find that. And also at my website, Leslie Cohen Ruberry, that's R-U-B-U-R-Y. Uh, I have a Facebook, I'm going to be starting a Facebook group so I can create a community of people talking based on the uh, podcast, haven't done that yet since it's so new. But Instagram, Facebook, and my website has lots of resources. Great. And I'll put all those links in the show notes. Thank you so much, Anae. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you want the links to get in touch with Leslie or to hear her podcast, go to simplefamilies.com forward slash episode 351. Thanks again. I'm glad you're here.